NBA, the NFL, golf, ping pong, and sports betting. Wait, back up. Ping pong? <laughs> what the hell? This is Jump Shots from the Goal Line. <laughs> takes and hilarious banter on everything from college football to the NBA and everything in between except ping pong. And we're not just flying solo. We're bringing in some heavy hitters from the world of sports, journalists, players, legends. You name it, we've got them. Why should they have all the fun? Bryant for the win. Bang! This is Jump Shots from the Goal Line. Where every episode is a slam dunk. And now your hosts, Jonathan Dugan and John Henningsen. Yo, yo, yo. Well, what is up, everybody? Uh, no Henny today. It's the last day of the Masters, so he, you know where he's at. He's in front of his TV watching that freaking golf, watching Scotty Scheffler win it all. But like I teased a couple of weeks ago, we are welcomed by one of my closest friends, uh, Jordan Wagner. So a little bit of backstory for y'all. Me and me and Wags, as I like to call them, have known each other. Shoot, bro. Like how long? Probably like at least. Yeah, we've probably been bonded by the Ravens for about the last. I know Flacco was the quarterback when I first yeah. started. So a while. Yeah, at least like probably I'd say like eight years, something like yeah. that. But, yeah. you know, we're part of a, a little Twitter group chat that uh it gets a little buck wild in there but you know it's all love um but the biggest thing about wags that y'all should know is that he was pretty close to uh some big time players at alabama from about 2012 to 2016 he's a wealth of knowledge of a, a huge part of the saban era and as the saban era sunsets on us all we welcome in uh you know exactly say a prayer pour one out for the homie uh, we welcome in coach DeBoer. Um, I think I think it's uh, about time that maybe we shed some light on what was really, really going down um, outside the gridiron of the Saban era. And there's nobody better to do it than my good friend Jordan Rag- Wagner. So, Jordan, welcome to the show, buddy. Thanks for having me, Doug. Um, I guess I could just get into it, man. Um, you know, going to Alabama when me and a lot of other people from around the state did, like what people don't realize about Nick Saban is – there are people that ended up going to Alabama that would have never went to that school if Alabama football was not what it was. Like, that man, I tell you, that man changed the face of a program and the landscape of football. That ain't just me glazing because he was my coach. Like, he, that man legit did a lot to change stuff. So, I mean, you got folks that are from all over the world coming to tiny-ass Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where the majority of the population is the goddamn school. Yeah. So... <laughs> You and you sitting up there, you know, you just, you know, regular going to class with the whip, and all of a sudden you stand at the bus stop. And I never forget one of his freshman year when Derrick Henry first got there. Speaking of a, a new Raven, Derrick Henry first got there his freshman year. And they was like, I was like, okay, cool. This is supposed to be this running back from Uly, Florida, broke all these records, broke Adrian Peterson's records. I'm like, all right, this motherfucker supposed to be legit. I'm 6'2, dog. That motherfucker pulled up next to me at that bus stop. And they listed it. Now, mind you, they listed this motherfucker at 6'3", 240. Right? Yeah. The man towers over me, standing next to me at the bus stop. And I look, I do a double take, and I'm like, oh, this must be a bat. Oh, no, that's not a basketball player. That is a fucking running back. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I was like, why would they say, man, only 6'3"? He is not an inch taller than me. But then you think about it. You list a running back at 6'6", 250. They're going to be like, why is his hand not in the dirt? So, yeah. so I guess that's why he, they kind of down. You know, normally they upsize with them college heights here, make you look bigger. Now they try to make him look smaller because he's way bigger than what they listed him as. <laughs> Did you see that picture of him recently? He was uh, standing there with uh, Braylon Allen from Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, and Braylon yeah. Allen's a big. He's a big back, bro. He's a power back. You know what he I about, mean? He's about six two, two thirty himself. So, bro, and he's standing next to Derrick Henry, and Derrick Henry looks like just. A freaking Greek god, and Braylon looks like you and me. <laughs> bro, I'm telling you, like that, that Mark Ingram picture, people thought it was just the angle. Like, no, bro, Mark Ingram is every bit about 5'11 and solid. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So to make Mark Ingram look like a middle school running back, you got to be pretty big. Yeah, yeah, for sure, bro, for sure. Oh, so let's let's start from the beginning, bro. I mean, 2012, Young Wags is down there at Alabama. What's what's 
popping down there, bro. What's that's that's also like not the early saving years, but like I mean, kind of right like, as you get to that, like it's kind of like that exposition record. I, I say the peak of the saving era probably was about 2016, 2017, when you had guys that were doing it, you know, just for their little piece of the pie, you know what I mean, and then the love of the game, knowing one day they was going to make millions. You would have guys that were third and fourth string that could go start anywhere else in the country back then. Yeah. There was a, like, what was it? Right after my freshman year, it was like 2013. That was a running back room. Had Alti Tiffany, Tyron Jones, Alvin Kamara, Derrick Henry. You know, like that, that was, it, TJ, yeah, that was a crazy running yeah, back TJ room. Yeah, TJ Yeldon, you know? yeah. Guy after guy, just NFL. Right. You know, like it, so 2012, we get down there, and of course, that's uh, AJ McCarron's senior year, and I, he's not my favorite Alabama quarterback of all time. But <laughs> why is that? <laughs> he was an interesting young man to be around, and uh, there's more, multiple people that understand what I mean by I say interesting. His, I say this, I like his brother Corey a lot better. I yeah. say that, <laughs> but it was AJ's last year. Coop's freshman year, I had a class with Amari Coop. I think we took English together that year. And I didn't, you know, Coop's so quiet, you don't even know who he is till you walk out and somebody say, you know, there's Amari Coop, <laughs> right? And it's like, this motherfucker is kitchen touchdown. <laughs> he don't say nothing. I would see him at part. He don't, he didn't really, Coop was just quiet, man. Yeah. Like, and uh, that was 2012. I think that was the very first time I got to meet Blake Sims. This was way before he was started. I think they had moved him to running back at that time. So you had, uh, I mean, I just, being a freshman, like, you know, say a freshman got to take morning classes. I had a lot of, like, a dumbass. I took a lot of 8 a.m. classes. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm just going to get it out the way. Yeah. Don't do that dumb shit. <laughs> <laughs> but I had classes with a lot of different players, and uh, I got to reconnect with a few guys that I played against in high school that I had met before. And there was a uh, I think it was the night we I was at Waffle House and I had finally reconnected with Brian Anderson. I hadn't seen him probably since the first game we played. I think it was twenty eleven we played. I hadn't seen him since then. So seeing him, I'm just like, God damn, he didn't got big since <laughs> seeing him in high school. Was that weight program down there? Scott Cochran. That dude was making monsters. Like you can say what you want to about the injuries, but Scott Cochran was making giant people. Like people that were already big, way bigger. Yeah. So, I mean, it was just, I think the main thing about the Savior there and why it was so, I guess, iconic for anybody that was a student is because, like I said, you could just be somewhere regular and be seeing guys that play on Sunday still to this day. Yeah. Talk, like, and the thing about them is they were still very, like, they were humble. You know what I'm saying? Like, there wasn't no, oh, I'm a, like, I mean, of course, you, you wanted to play for the best college football programs of all time in front of millions of people every Saturday. You're going to have a little ego to yourself, but they wasn't like, you know what I'm saying, dickheads to where they, you couldn't talk to them. They wouldn't carry no conversation with you. Like, they saw you out, and you weren't just being fanned out about it. They carry yeah. a conversation with you, no, because at the end of the day, they are still normal people, you know? Yeah. And they're the same age as you. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? and, that, 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 and that's the thing. Like, there was, like, I would see, like, you know, a day or, you know, a, like, parents weekend, people would come up and get autographs, and you got 40, 50-year-old adults sitting up there treating these 19 year old kids like god you know what i mean yeah. because, they, because they can run a football or catch a football real good you know but us you know it's like well i remember this guy we played against each other in high school he beat my ass but we did yeah. I, I remember him from you know he's still the same person he yeah. just plays for nick saban now you know yeah and most of these guys come from just like i mean it's the south so like they're coming from small towns anyway so Ray they're... Patrick, uh, you saw his son catch it, which God, I, 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 it's still so wild for me to say. Dre Kirkpatrick's son plays for Alabama. The man was a <laughs> senior when I was a freshman in high school, and now his son plays for Alabama. I'm We're so old now, Wags. We're old, bro. I know, I know, and I hate. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it. Dre must have had him real young, though, huh? He like did, probably he like did. there was that's you know they always make the joke in Gump Twitter they call Alabama Twitter they always make the joke to say that's back when people had kids and was trying to fight off felonies but like real shit you had, you had, <laughs> you had folks that were still you know one foot out the trenches like football was their way out and yeah some of them did have kids yeah I think uh, Kenny Bell I think he had a few while he was uh, at Alabama and he was working his ass off to take care of him he wasn't no deadbeat either he was stand up guy you know yeah. 
So let's talk about some of the wild ass stories. Cause like, again, you and I've been friends for, you know, coming up on a decade <laughs> right. without saying names, you know, you can, you can do whatever you want, right? Like right. so-and-so player or whatever, but like, I've heard some stories and I know for one thing, we can sit here and say that Alabama football players were approachable and this and that and well-mannered, mm-hmm. but I also know there's some players that you hung out <laughs> with that were in your circle that were buck ass wild. So I guess it. Bro. It was I, oh my God. So I think everybody knows this story. As I can say it, now he don't give a fuck. <laughs> Blake yeah. Blake Zims, that boy, he used to have. He was a hard worker. He used to handle his business, but that boy liked to have fun too. Yeah, I never forget the night I'm out. I'm out partying. My day, I'm self doing my day. I'm like, you know, young, being young me. If you know, you know. And I'm falling off in Waffle House like four or five in the morning. I'm like, all right, I've been out all night. I need to eat something. I'm sitting up there, and everybody crowded around one table, and I see, and you know, I'm walking by to get to sit down. I'm like, oh, okay, that's Blake. Blake, see him? Yeah. No, but we play Florida at 2 o'clock today, and it's 5 a.m. <laughs> Don't you think you should be sleeping? <laughs> and I'm sitting up there worrying, like, oh, my God. I turn on the TV. I think I, I fall asleep. I get home myself around about 6 or 7. I fall asleep for a few hours, wake up, start back drinking like I do, you know, so I can watch, watch the game. Yeah. I get up. I see this motherfucker come out the gate. Toss a touchdown to Kenyon Drake. And I'm like, okay. Clearly, he he doesn't have a problem with that. He, he knows how to manage both. So, yeah, the man fresh out of Waffle House at God knows whatever time he left, tossed him a 400 and a couple touchdowns on Florida that afternoon. After partying all night. I, <laughs> and what's crazy is, I mean, anybody can tell you, he wasn't the only one. Like, that was the thing you had to have balance. You know what I mean? You yeah. didn't know how to do both. Yeah. I wonder what coach, which coach Saban used to think about that. I mean, he probably, he probably couldn't say too much if the guy goes out there and throws four hundred, right? I mean, look, you saw what they said in their last their podcast. He was on. He said Saban said, "But y'all went out there kneeling and go doing this for touchdown, but then sitting up there smoking and drinking all night." So no, he didn't <laughs> like it because Saban's still old school, man. He didn't yeah. like it, but like you said, what can you say to a guy that got four hundred yards and three touchdowns? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's one that's one story. And Blake, like, I mean, he had a he had a good career in at Alabama. And- he start, you know what's so funny about Blake is like, and so many people can vouch for me on this. I remember I had a African American history class. Shout out to Mr. Foster. I had an African American history class. The season the season right before him and Amari Cooper broke records. I had African American yeah. history class with him. He kept saying, you know, we had got real cool because we sat by each other. And he uh he kept saying, bro, I know I'm gonna start, you know, and you know. It had been so long since I had seen a black quarterback start at Alabama. You know, I believed in him, but in my back of my mind, I'm like, some kind of way this ain't going to go in his favor. But he worked his ass off. Lane yeah. Kiffin comes in. He gives an offense that just – it just works for Blake. And then all of a sudden, he shatters pretty much all of A.J. McCarron's senior – all of A.J. McCarron's single-season passing records that he set the year right before. Yeah. Mari Cooper set receiver records in that offense. Like – and. It's all because somebody believed in Blake and didn't just keep moving him from running back to quarterback, running back. You know, somebody believed in him. Yeah. And I remember really that. Did. I remember that. I remember when AJ left, like, everybody was like, well, who the hell is going to start now? Mm-hmm. And then there Blake was, just kind of oh came out of God. nowhere. That was such a big argument on Alabama. That was, the, that was back during the who your quarterback days, you know, when everybody – that yeah. was how they would – you know, during the saving era, they all try to find a different way to troll you because it's like these motherfuckers can't keep, these motherfuckers keep winning. How, how are they going to stop winning? Oh, they ain't got no quarterback. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because it was something people would argue about a lot. Like it was back when um I think Alec Morris was still on campus. He ended up going to North Texas. Phillip, uh Eli, I think, was still he ended up going to Toledo. And then it was I think uh what was the guy's name? Yeah, I think that was pretty much it. They was like they were thinking all these guys that were backing up AJ were gonna start, and then I was like, Okay, we're running a Lane Kiffin offense. You don't think the guy that can run might be the best fit? Yeah. You know, that was before people were a little bit more open-minded, I'll say, than that they are now. They're like, no, 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 we need a traditional quarterback. This up there, you can hand it off for play action, and, and that's boring, and people are figuring that out. Have you not realized that? Yeah, exactly. And with that stable of running backs, too, like having the dual threat capability was huge, right? Right, because imagine, like, yeah, it was cool that year before when you had 2012. I mean, that's how you beat Georgia, you know. T.J. Yeldon and Eddie Lacy, too, had a monster just back and forth. You get tired of tackling Eddie Lacy, big round ass, and then here comes T.J. Yeldon, who's fresh and built like a Greek god fresh out of high school. 
can't do shit with that. I was but gonna say, bro, year, Eddie Lacy's the guy that was probably at Waffle House till six in the morning. Bro, <laughs> that boy Eddie. I don't know how he was so out of shape, but in shape at the same time. <laughs> I would never. Under- there was this restaurant on the strip. It's still there too. Chinese place called Swin. It wasn't even that good. It was just one of the few Chinese places that was like close to that boy Eddie. He probably could still tell you his order from somewhere, right? Now. <laughs> that man love that Chinese food. That man love Chinese food. It, like I, I don't know what it was, man. But as another one, they they downsized and they talking about some oh he's these six feet and two thirty for no that motherfucker got around. <laughs> he, <laughs> he was like pushing two eighty, bro. <laughs> no, it was hilarious watching him run because it's like this the dude I just watched scarf down. All that sesame chicken, like, <laughs> yeah, he was so good though. Man, you know, he was. It just some folks really, really care about football. Some folks know football just they way out. Yeah, I ain't gonna say Eddie didn't care about football because everybody that plays football cares about it to an extent. But I think if he cared a little bit more, he would have played a little longer than he did for sure. Yeah, he got kind of, kind of kicked out of Green Bay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just for showing I mean, up to you know, camp repeatedly overweight. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like the Zion Williams thing. Like, you can't keep showing up fat and not no. passing the physical. Not at running back. <laughs> not at running back. Especially yeah. when, and then, like, what? I, man, I was thinking about that the other day. That was kind of like the beginning of the end for running backs getting paid and drafted high, too, because I think Leonard Fournette was like the last one to go top 10, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. As a big right. running back like that. Yeah, like now is now you would just rather draft a guy between the second and the sixth round and let him price himself out and draft it, do it all again in four or five years. Because yeah, that's pretty much the shelf life of a running back anyway these days. It's about five years. Yeah, look at Saquon. You know, I mean, Man, we thought that, he was going to be off the after. guy, right? Like, and, it's, it, and I ain't gonna say fall off, but that prime, like, man, your prime. When you got Quick. athletes that are as good as you, when you got people like Micah Parsons and Aaron Donald playing on defense, that prime shrinks quick. Yeah, absolutely, bro. So <clears throat> 2012 and 2013, though, like we were kind of we kind of alluded to, back to back national champions. You're you're at Alabama at that point. What was that city like? So it was 2011, 2012. 2011 was my last year of high school football and I had took one of my I took one of my visits down there during to the the game of the century for the Alabama LSU game. We lost nine to six. I saw that and you know the city then you could even tell like it was different. Like and it, I remember going to Alabama games as a kid and like you know you would play certain SEC teams and yeah they hate you but they kind of be like oh I remember what your program used to be. Let's just have fun today. <laughs> Versus that was the first time that 2011 game of the century was the first time I remember hearing LSU fans really like hate us again. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like for like real, like, Alabama. It. right? Yeah, like like really like okay, shit. These motherfuckers are about just as good as we are, but it don't matter. We're gonna whoop their ass. Like that was the first time I had really seen that in person because you know, coming up, I didn't get to go to many like big football games. You know what I yeah. mean? Like I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. The the most the biggest local team I had was UAB football. You know, yeah. And going to Alabama games when I was young and then see, watching Saban rebuild that program back to what Bear Bryant had and then some was like, I mean, even today, when I first got to Tuscaloosa it was in 2012, like I, I remember there was this one little road I would always get off in this place called Cottondale. And I knew I was almost there because I would see at this little four corner stop, uh, Wendy's right here. Uh, a little Winn-Dixie grocery store right here. And then this little Chinese place across the street. That same little square right there now got a whole little, like, strip mall right there. The Wendy's attached to this giant gas. Like, it just, everything changed. Then you keep on going in town. You know, after the tornado in 2011, it took a lot of that stuff away. Once all those different students, and specifically international students, bringing all that extra money to the school happened, plus Nick Saban, like, you started getting stuff like specialty stores that would only be in certain regions, like, Putting, you know, a Wawa there just for, you know, the up north kids, you know, putting certain California stores in, in Tuscaloosa just for the kids from out west and stuff like that. Like you started yeah. seeing niche stuff in this tiny little town in Alabama that used to not really be about nothing. Football really injected so much into that economy as well. Like it changed not just the program, but a city, too. Yeah. And now look at them. <laughs> you know That's what I mean? right. Like, 
that's why it made me laugh so much when everybody's like, ha, oh, Saban's gone. You're not, no, you don't understand how building a program works, do you? He left that program in such a good shape now that, like, you have to be an idiot to crash the Ferrari, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like, just keep it in the road. That's and all it's you not even, do as a coach. It's not even just football either. Like, look at basketball going to the Elite Eight. Man, like, like baseball too. Like baseball has gotten better and better before the you know the most recent scandal. But it baseball had been getting better and better. Softball went from good to better. Like people don't understand. Like with athletics, like if one of your programs is doing good, they help bring money to your other programs, which yeah. then makes them be able to get money. And I figured that out. Coaching money is probably the most important thing you need in football. Unfortunately, it don't matter how many kids you can get. It don't matter. You don't got the equipment, the facilities, and the things to entice people to want to come to where you are and that'd be at any level from youth football all the way to the nfl if you ain't got the money tough shit yeah and i know you mentioned money right and like saban has gone on record saying that nil was like one of the reasons why he decided to just kind of you know hang it up saying hey i don't want to compete like this but i want to ask you with Mm -hmm. you being on campus being around these players from you know 2012 to 2016 i can tell Mm -hmm. you this much here at Arizona, like players were for sure getting paid. We're for sure getting like cars because I saw it, right? Come on, dog. Like we can pretend, like, and that's what killed me about. It. And th- I'm glad you said you saw it here at Arizona too. People always try to do that thing where oh Alabama pays their pl-. bro. It was a whole documentary on what SMU was doing in the '80s, bro. Yeah, like Pony if you Express. think Alabama is the first program to throw a kid a bag under the table. If you think any SEC or oh, it's just the SEC, no, bro. All of these schools for all of these sports, it's all, like we just said, driven by money at the end of the day. Like, you have, okay, case in point, you might be some little shitty school out there and you, know, you might be Missouri, right? Yeah. What they had with Luther Burton, right? Yeah. Luther Burton, number one wide receiver in the country. He has zero goddamn reason to be going to Missouri. He would have been at Alabama, Ohio State, wherever, any other yeah. year. But because they can throw Luther Burton a bag, now he plays for Missouri. Yeah. Ten years ago, Luther Burton ass would have been in Tuscaloosa. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Because back now that it and, and people say, oh, it, it, Saban just doesn't like it because it's 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 it's, it's an even playing field. It's still not an even playing field. The no. biggest schools are still going to get the best players. The oh, yeah. schools with the most money and the most prestige to their name, because that still matters to some of these kids, are always going to get the big players. The thing about the thing about it that Nick Saban and that people misconstrue that quote is, it's not that he hated NIL. He hated the fact that the shit was unregulated because. Why, after I just gave this kid last year $500,000, am I having to next year have a meeting with him in my office and say, hey, where he says, hey, hey, I know you gave me this, but Ohio State's offering me this to leave. So, like, can you either guarantee me some playing time or more money? Right. And it's like, at that point, why the fuck did I leave the NFL? I left the NFL because I don't want to deal with this shit. Yeah. I I I agree with you, bro. I agree with you. because be like, so many, like, with anything, there has to be rules and regulations to this shit. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, you can't just say, all right, here's a blank checkbook, and whatever kid you want, long as he fits under your scholarship cap, can go there. Yeah. Well, that's how you kill a lot of small programs. Because mm-hmm. then it's always going to be about, well, how did this kid do with the opening? How did he do with the rivals? Because I'm buying. How did he do with the ESPN 300? Because they're man, recruiting services have kind of ruined football because people think, oh, if this kid didn't go to these camps and I don't have quantitative data on him, he isn't worth anything. He's not going to be a good player. If this kid's not at least a three star, what does that even mean, first of all? Yeah, what does three star, four star, five star really mean? It means potential. It means potentially this kid could be an NFL great one day if he's a five star. And if yeah. he's a one star, it's like maybe this kid will play okay at D three ball. Yeah. And I have seen one stars go on to be 10 year all pros, and I've seen five stars be nothing. Yeah. Green, especially nothing. Obama. Man. Speaking of the class of 2012, my high school graduating class, like, Dorio Green Beckham was the number one wide receiver and the number one player in the country that year. 
Dorio Green Beckham played what four or five years in the, in the NFL. And he never really made a like next, right. Yeah, he never made made a mark either. He was supposed to be the next great one, and he wasn't. Right. It's, it's you know it's, it's that same thing with Clint. Jadavion Hunter was really good, but when he first got to the league, it took him a little while to get to what he was, and then he's kind of been inconsistent, you know, because he's either been hurt or somewhere he hated since yeah. then. That five star rating doesn't do anything but put pressure on a talented kid. I feel like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, cause case in point, you talking about at Alabama? I never forget how excited I was in 2014 going into 2015 when Blake Barnett got there. It's just like, oh man, we got this kid who's the one of the best quarterbacks in the country. It's like he was the number one pocket passer and then also the number three dual threat quarterback in the country. His high school highlights from Corona was crazy. And he wasn't doing it versus no scrubs. I'm talking about Bishop Gorman, Mater D, all that. He's in yeah, there whooping, yeah. you know, future NFL players' asses. Then he gets to Alabama, and for some reason, he can't grasp a Lane Kiffin offense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's like, well, shit, what does five stars really mean then? Like I said, five stars just means, you know, potential. Because they're like, there's really no way to, because what about those kids who can't afford, and I've coached them, what about those kids who can't afford to go to all these different camps to get the exposure? Does that mean he's not good? Does that mean his 4,000 yards in two years is null and void because he didn't go to a camp? Right. Does that mean right. that he's not a good – does that mean this kid that caught 30 touchdowns over the last three seasons is not a good wide receiver because he couldn't afford to play on a seven-on-seven seven, seven on seven team that traveled during the summer? Right. right. That doesn't mean he's a bad player. That just means he didn't get exposure. Right. Yeah, dude, I mean, you look at, like, Arizona's a, a great case point, right? Like, we interviewed Tremaine Bonder on last week, and he mm-hmm. – he was a two-star guy out of Vallejo, California. Couldn't afford to go to those camps. Couldn't afford to, you know, whatever. Comes to Arizona and was like one of our best defensive players of the last decade. So, or Noah Fafita, great example too, right? Man, five love foot, Fafita. five foot ten kid, three-star, low three-star recruit, right? If he would have been six one, six two, he's a, a four-star, he five, four star. five star. Yeah, and now he's top five quarterback in the nation, getting looks from Alabama, apparently according to his dad. You know, and like, <laughs> yeah. but dude, I mean, that I agree with you. Going back on the NIL stuff, I, I'm so happy that players are like officially getting paid nowadays, but I agree with you. Like, there, I think there should be, I think there should be like a contract to it. Like, treat them like an actual employee, right? Like, hey, you're going to come to the school. Here's the, the terms of the, the contract. You're going to get paid, you know, XYZ number, $500,000 a year. And we are expecting you to have, been here for three to four years Mm -hmm. and here's a buyout number if you want to leave here's the buyout here's what the other university has to pay us Mm -hmm. as an organization you You know what i mean and like we're not doing astronomical numbers to where it's the nfl but we're giving a level of protection to these teams because arizona is another great example right jed fish Mm -hmm. goes to washington is trying to poach every freaking player in the world from arizona Mm -hmm. and like luckily there's a sense of community a sense of like you know, respect towards the program. So, like, guys like T-Mac and Noah Fee don't don't leave. But we've lost, like, half of our defense to Washington, to Mm -hmm. whoever, right? So Mm -hmm. I think the next step in regulating this stuff is, you know, making these agreements, you know, um, contract-driven and Mm -hmm. having buyouts attached to them. I think that would be the best way to do it. Well, see, and, and I completely agree. Don't think this statement is me saying I disagree. But the reason why that won't happen, at least not right now, because then we're going to have to admit something really uncomfortable, that the NCAA really doesn't run anything and that they don't really have a say in this shit anymore. Yeah, then we kind of have to admit that the NCAA doesn't really have any power to control this. And not only that, we also have to admit this one word, that the that the NCA really doesn't like that it's not amateurism anymore. Yeah, but it's not. <laughs> you know, it I mean, hasn't it's been really for not. years. It hasn't. So, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I think the NCAA is on its way out anyway. It's on its last legs. I think what's going to happen is you know the the SEC, the Big Ten are going to cause it to be a super league the big 12 and the acc are probably going to have to join up and we're going to have kind of a three-headed monster you know and they'll regulate themselves i think they're going to do away with the ncaa they're right and all it's going to take is for that one school to finally have enough balls to go through with an antitrust because the antitrust lawsuit is, is 
essentially means the end of the NCAA. That's pretty much going to mean that, okay, you guys don't exist anymore. We don't really, there's no need for you. Like yeah, we just need yeah. to dissolve you, pay the people that you owe money, what you owe it. Cause if it's an antitrust suit, they're going to have to prove that, you know, they didn't act unethically, you know yeah. what I mean? And uh, again, it's so much money involved, which is, I, I hate to keep saying it, but it's so much money involved that that's going to be a slow, a, a kind of a, a slow effect to get to that point because nobody wants to just cut that off. Because that's going to mean a lot of people can't line their pockets anymore. Yeah. And, and know, a lot of litigation too. Right. A lot of litigation. And at the end of the day, that's going to mean a lot of people that a lot of people gonna get in trouble too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and at the end of the day, at the top, a lot of these guys are still friends and they don't want to get their friends in trouble. So yeah, it's kind of the old boys club. You know what I mean? Pretty much. So, well, let's go back a little bit. I, I want to hear some more stories from you just about your time at Alabama. You know, let, give me two things. Who was mm -hmm. the player that surprised you the most? And then number two, who was the craziest player that you were around? And you don't have to say names. Okay. You can just say position or whatever. You know, hey, I knew this wide receiver, this this mm -hmm. defensive tackle. Mm -hmm. And well, if the people want to put the pieces together, they can. Oh, for sure. Um, when it when it, I don't want to. You know, we don't want to out anybody, right? Mm -hmm. um, we want to keep those connections <laughs> valid. But right. you know, give me a little bit of the dirt. <laughs> okay, so you said craziest, craziest is oh my god. Craziest is going to be a DB who was an early enrollee who <laughs> one of his very first nights there, he got uh, he got into a, um, a spat with local authorities and uh, ended up tasered and pepper sprayed in my apartment complex after attending a party that got shut down. He didn't feel like it should have been shut down. Yeah. So, it was interesting uh db number the, two at the time what was the aftermath of that I, nothing he went home <laughs> <laughs> hey nothing like being an alabama football player right <laughs> nothing <laughs> he went home <laughs> um let's see and then what was your other question you say i answered crazy and what was the other one the one that surprised so, me the most yeah still got to be blake because yeah. to go from being like the fifth string quarterback one year to the like fourth string running back for like two years, then back to backup quarterback the year after, and then the starter, and then break records when you do. Yeah. And like that's different. You know what I mean? Yeah. How about a player that you enjoyed hanging around the most? Like being around the most. <sighs> Probably that boy Brandon Ivory, man. Shout out to that boy B. Ivory. Uh, he was a nose guard, I think. When, we'll see. When, did he, when was B. Ivory there? B. Ivory was there, I think, from 2010 to 2014. Yeah, I think so. B. Ivory was real cool, man. He was he just a chill dude. Like, he, I mean, he played the same position I did. He, he acted a lot like me. He just wanted to, you know, stay out the way and, you know, do his thing. Yeah, yeah, I get you. What was your favorite memory well, you were at Alabama. <sighs> mm, it's either the night we beat Georgia and everybody ran through the fountain outside the old Ferguson Student Center. It's December, by the way, when that happened. Everybody <laughs> ran through the fountain in, in fucking December after the Georgia game. Yeah. And we beat Georgia because Mark Rick didn't know how timeouts worked. <laughs> or the year we made Zach Mettenberger crawl off the field versus LSU. <laughs> <laughs> guy was that supposed was, to be the next big quarterback too man because he, he had gave us hell the uh, year before in lsu that was the game i think we had to have the tj yeldon walk off yeah i think that was a year they had tj yeldon walk off and then they come back that next year bad uh medenberger looked defeated yeah. but he, he but he didn't he, he didn't he he, he he ain't let nobody pick him up he crawled and then got up and walked off the field yeah he wasn't no bitch i'll give him that <laughs> So let's talk about the future then, right? So mm -hmm. Kalen DeBoer comes over from Washington. Um, he brought his OC initially. He's gone now. 
going figured going that too that. sadly yeah um you guys i felt like you kept a lot of good players right mm -hmm. I mean, as it is anytime there's a coaching change there's going to be a little bit of movement but you guys kept most everybody um that was you... go no, ahead go ahead because i I'm, I'm pretty sure i'm fixing to answer what you say after you answer this say this question go ahead i was gonna say how do you feel going into the year so elephant in the room time right Losing Isaiah Bond hurt. Anybody yeah. that tells you losing Isaiah Bond didn't hurt is just being a little baby back bitch that's trying to cope. Sorry. Yeah. They are. Losing Isaiah Bond hurt. Losing Earl Litter. Or fuck. Earl Little <laughs> in the portal. That yeah. sucks. You know, especially with you know how thin we are at, uh, at scholarship DB. But Jeremy Bernard is the fucking truth. That guy watching him yesterday, that was that's a guy that's been waiting to be wide receiver one for a long time. Cause that's soft hands, great route running, fluid motion at the hips. Like he he that's a player. Mm -hmm. Jalen Milro, funny. What funny what it looks like when you believe in your quarterback and you call plays to his strength. And yeah. you don't make him have to overprocess or do something he's not comfortable doing. You know? Everybody's still talking about some Ty Simpson looks like the better quarterback. If Ty Simpson was the better quarterback, he'd be playing. Y'all tried them all last year. <laughs> we, we literally played everybody that needed to play last year. Like, and that was so funny. Everybody talking about, some, oh, my God, back when everybody was panicking. And I, that's another reason I'm pretty sure Saban retired. Imagine being the best football coach of all time and some idiot with four teeth says, oh, no, I think he needs to go and try somebody. What the fuck do you know? <laughs> This man's been doing this for 40 years. Yeah. You, you don't know shit. <laughs> like, it, that USF game, that let me to save, that let me know Saban was pity just like I am. Like, okay, motherfucker, y'all think this guy that I chose isn't the best quarterback? Cool, let's play all of them and see who does yeah. the best. This guy yeah. won't even play. Let's play all the other ones. And then when we were down by three at halftime, they were like, wait a minute. Maybe the black guy is the one we need to play. <laughs> hey, it is, it's still Alabama, bro. I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, it, listen, listen. The thing about it, Tyler Buckner shouldn't have still been playing football. That's a lacrosse player. He he showed yeah. that when he entered the portal as a lacrosse player. Yeah. Ty Simpson, yes, he's got that Johnny Manziel archetype, but every motherfucker that can run around and throw a dime on a rope while cross his body is not Johnny Manziel. Right. Yeah, those highlights are impressive. Think about why he was running in the first place, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's that's usually a skill that you learn out of Caleb Williams doesn't throw those amazing passes on a rope across his body, running to his left, back to the right, because you're like, yes, he's talented, but that's not like a product of him being talented. That's a product of necessity. He does that because he's running for his life as soon as he takes the snap. Oh, yeah, I can confirm that USC's offensive line was garbage. Like, They're sure. terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what everybody does. Like, oh, y'all need to be worried about Lincoln Riley and, and, and USC. I said, with what lines? Yeah. With, with, with what O-line, D-line do I need to be worried about a quarterback that's going to go number Like, cool, he's going to go number one. They're gonna do shit though. No, I knew that they were gonna be terrible and they still had Alex Grinch as their, as their DC. Alex <laughs> Grinch is proof to me that nepotism is alive and well in football. <laughs> because if you're telling me him still having a job is not the product of somebody he's related to being notable. Yeah. It was like, like him and Brian Ferentz, bro. That was nepotism last year. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god man like my god it's it's one of those things man like how bad how bad can you let it get before you realize okay maybe i'm not the best fit yeah absolutely so yeah. who else should we be on the lookout for this year then because i mean with deborah's offense i mean his he's an offensive guy mm -hmm. you know who do you think is really going to pop off this year is it going to be no it's going to be that stable of running backs. I, I have not seen a talented group of running backs like this since whew, since that year I was telling you about with Alvin Kamara and Derrick Henry and TJ Yeldon all in the same, you know, running back room. Yeah. This is going to be a year where, because, you know, that one running back that he got from, I think it was South Carolina that he ended up having at Washington was doing great just being pretty much the bell cow. Having three or four bell cows makes that offense pop a lot more. And it's going to be so much variety. So I think Jam Miller, Justice Haynes, and Richard Young are all going to do great things this year. Yeah. Okay. And then how about the defense? Um, like, 
So, dude, I am so ready to see what they end up doing with these safeties. Because, listen, I'm a sicko. So, in my defenses, I always like for that box boundary safety to kind of be an extra linebacker that just likes to ruin people's day by knocking the shit out of them. Yeah, I, I know you saw the sparkle in my eyes when I said that because that's you're a Ravens fan too, so I know this. <laughs> I love watching a safety that just likes to knock people the fuck out. Yeah, Bray Hubbard. I was because I'm watching 18. The 18's flying all over the fucking field. And I'm like, who is this white boy with this mullet in his helmet? And number 18 just flying yeah. around knocking the shit out of people. Bray Hubbard, he's playing that box safety role. I really like Bray Hubbard. I really think. Shout out my alma mater, Clay Chalkley High School kid that we got that was the number one player in Alabama this year named Jalen Mbakwe. He's probably going to be really good at corner. Even if it's not this year, he's probably going to be really good at corner or safety because the kid has natural ball skills and natural coverage. Like People ask me, who does he remind you of? He honestly kind of reminds me a little bit of like and, and ignore his NFL career when I say this. A little bit of a younger D Milliner, kind of in between like a D Milliner, Drake Kirkpatrick type, because he's rangy. He does not mind hitting, but he also has like instincts that you just cannot teach, right? You know, somebody like he's kind of like the best of both worlds when it comes to them. Now, is he, he played all over the field. The kid played quarterback for last year and won a state championship as a quarterback. He, he plays all over the field. He left, you know, as an athlete, but. His future's at DB, and once he gets just straight work at DB at a college level and a college weight program, that kid's going to be so good, man. Yeah. And I really also like another kid from local, from Birmingham, because, man, that's one thing you've got to do if you're going to be the coach at Alabama. You've got to recruit the major cities in Alabama. Right. This kid, Tim Keenan the third, shout out to him, <laughs> and shout out his pops, because his pops knows mine. Tim King the third is going to be a really good defensive tackle this year. A really yeah. good plug and play nose guard on short yardage. And even on passing downs, he showed me a lot as far as a pass rusher. He, the hands, man, the hands and the pad level, which is one of the biggest things I teach. Violet hands and low pads because low man wins every time. And he just, he's consistent with it. He might be a bigger guy. You know, he's around 6'1", 330, 340. So he's not going to be an every down guy. But when he's out there, oh, my God. The things I watched him do to some of the best old linemen we played last year was – it made me happy. <laughs> it made me happy yeah. for sure. I bet, man. And your your O-line should be a little bit better this year, right? It y'all should kept, be. Y'all kept we, uh, the kid from Iowa, right? <laughs> we, we took him back, yes. Yeah. <laughs> what a weird saga that guy's been. And that's why I hate this NIL shit. Yeah. What do you mean he left and now he's like, wait, fuck, I have to go back to Iowa. I'm the best offensive player here, and I play left tackle. Yeah. Oh fuck. Uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> yeah. Like it. It's so wild because what do you mean he all of a sudden like what do you mean you can leave say you're coming to my school to finish out your career and then all of a sudden say mm, never mind. Right. And like you know, and I hate to say it even the Caleb Downs thing like everybody's like, oh he's gonna go to Georgia well he was respectful of Alabama he went to Ohio State if if he was just respecting being there why didn't you just stay. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if it was about money, you could have stayed, had your guaranteed starting spot in a new defense that suits you. But, hey, everybody that transferred is like Malachi Moore said. They ain't in crimson. Fuck them. Yeah. What do you think about I, – and I know that he – I don't think he's even really practiced yet. I think something's mm-hmm. going on outside the field. But Parker Brailsford, the center. So, based on what I know from the people I've talked to, he's kind of just taking a little time right now to decide if he's going to keep playing football. I don't know why he's considering just not doing the football thing anymore. It's a personal he's reason. He's good, too. He, man, to, because when I first saw him, I was like, oh, he's kind of light in the ass, 270. Yeah. But he out there whooping folks' ass. He's kind of like Linderbaum. You it's know? really weird to watch. He's like a skinny Tyler Linderbaum. Yeah. It's really weird to watch. But. It's going to be – it's it's it'll be a decision that he makes over the summer. And if the man decides to retire from football, hey, I get it. Because I've, I've there's been a few people that were going to go to Alabama to play football that decided, no, nah, I'm going to play another sport. Or, no, nah, I'm just not going to play football anymore. 
yeah. a, a kid in a class, I think it was class of 2020, 2021, one of the best offensive tackles and defensive ends in the state decided he was going to not play football no more and just go play baseball. So, yeah, I mean, it happens. If, if this kid decides he doesn't want to play no more, it's cool. From what I saw yesterday, I couldn't make out the last name, but 69 who played center yesterday, his snaps were pretty clean. He had a few errant ones, but that's something you can work on over the summer. Just put a put a ball in a bucket of water and have his ass snap it until it don't slip out of his hand anymore. Real simple fix. Um, I, I like where the O-line is, especially considering that's not the O-line that's going to go out there week one. It still looked pretty good. And the ball was getting out so fast, their job's not going to be hard. Yeah. It's not going to be last year where you're having to – like fourth and 31 happened last year because they blocked their asses off for about 12 seconds. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? And just an insane throw, but it was no, and that's what made me still question why people were questioning Jalen Milrose arm talent. It's like you see the throws he makes, you see that it's there. It's not like a I'm really gonna hate myself for saying this. It's not like a Jalen Hurts situation where it's like the guy is what he is, and he's always going to be what he is. Jalen Hurts my favorite Alabama quarterback of all time. Everybody named Mama know that. But the man was what he was. Yeah. He still is what he is. You yeah. Know what I mean? We he, saw that this year. Yeah. We're we not, we not going to get nothing but what he is. That may just be 2,700 yards, 22 touchdowns, and four interceptions with uh, about 800 rushing. But he ain't going to win you no games for real, for real, going crazy passing. Yeah. That's just – that just is what it is. Yeah. Jalen Milrow a little bit different. It's more of that Lamar shit where it's like, ah, I see what he's trying to do. Yeah. It's not that he can't do it. It's just he can't do it yet. Yeah. yeah. You got to develop throws, a little bit more. Right. It's throws that Lamar made last year that the year before he wouldn't have. Mm-hmm. It's throws that Lamar Jackson made the year after his Heisman that to me were better throws than he made, you know what I mean, the year that he won. I think he honestly had the better season a more Heisman worthy season that second season because he had about the same amount of rushing yards, a little bit more touchdowns, less carries, a little bit more passing yards, more touchdowns, less attempts, higher accuracy. Right. And that's when I was like, okay. Because another thing, I hated Lamar Jackson this freshman year. I was like, oh my God, he's setting black quarterbacks back a million <laughs> years. He's just running around. Oh, and then the next year, it's more polished. It's like, okay. So my motherfucker knows how to play. And then he goes out and plays LSU. It's like, aha, I knew it. He can't do yeah. this shit consistently. And the next year he comes out and does it better. And I'm like, oh, fuck. This is actually a really good quarterback. And I need yeah. to make some statements. <laughs> and then we draft him. And I'm like, hell yeah. Because yeah. by that point, it's like, whew, I'm really tired of watching Flacco go out there and not care. Yes, the man won us a Super Bowl. <laughs> but how long can I keep saying that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, oh, speaking okay. of the NFL, though, like, we'll, we'll end the show with this, but, like, it's it's draft season, baby. And, you know, our group chat goes wild this time of year. It already is, right? Mm-hmm. We got we got us all putting out mock drafts, I feel like, every single day. Mm-hmm. But Alabama's Alabama. They're going to put out, you know, 10 guys into the draft every year. And with Ozzy still at the helm, too, I got two questions for you. Mm-hmm. What guys are going to be the most impressive in the league? And then number two – who are the Ravens drafting, bro? Like, which which of these cats you think can realistically go to to Baltimore? True. Okay, that's gonna be good. Um, the guy from Alabama that I can pretty much say is a lot like gonna be at least a ten year play or gonna be at least a seven to ten year player, and he's gonna make multiple Pro Bowls, maybe some All Pros. I truly feel like that's probably going to be Dallas Turner because Dallas Turner is. Man, he's he's so he's fun nasty. to watch off the edge. He can be he has bend, he has great length and athleticism. He but he's not weak. He's not he's not his flaws are things that are very correctable. He sometimes over pursues, he sometimes yeah. makes the wrong move, and sometimes his hands aren't as violent as they should be. But other than that, like the guy is pretty much the complete package that you want in one of those hybrid edge rushers nowadays. My dark horse is the fucking psychopath that we got from Georgia that fought that that fought that fucking lady <laughs> after the Tennessee game, Jermaine Burton, because <laughs> that motherfucker can play. He's just psychotic. Like he he is one of those people that he can run routes, he can catch. His problem is just up here. And yeah, everybody's yeah. like, well you don't draft a guy like that. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Five of like the top ten receivers of all time were sociopaths. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like him and AD Mitchell are both just insanely talented but just 
psychos. Psychotic. A.D. Mitchell's, <laughs> AD Mitchell's is more so a, uh, I will go out of my way to prove my point. I don't give a fuck if we're down by seven and we need, if we're down by three and I just need to make this catch. No, I'm going to go for a touchdown because you yeah. tried me. <laughs> Jermaine Burton is more so, all right, you might get me these first couple, but I'm fixing to whoop your ass, get up talking shit, and try to fight you after I get yeah. this catch. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, but it's, it's different levels of crazy. Now, as far as Alabama guys, I realistically think could fall to us. There's been a lot of talk from a lot of different camps where a lot of the people that people think are going to go top 10, like a couple of those guys aren't going to go top 10 and they're going to fall. If they fall, it's going to make other guys fall. Yeah. Terry Arnold, I think he's going to go top 15 no matter what. Um, Dallas Turner, unfortunately, I know we won't get him. I think he's going to go top 15 no matter what. Yeah. I realistically think the Kool-Aid could fall to us if they're, if they, if people are worried about that foot. Oh no, we lost Wags. Let me let me get him back on here for us, guys. Give me a second. All right, you're back. No, you're good. <laughs> Kool Aid could fall into that range for sure. Um, everybody else, I think. I mean, JC Latham, he probably will. He, he probably could fall into that range if with us because he's like what ranked like the number. Like people are projecting in between going as early as 19 and as late as from the top of the second round. So maybe JC Latham, he plays right tackle. He had a bad year kind of down the stretch, but overall he had a solid year. Um, realistically, a lot of the Alabama guys that we're probably going to be able to get is going to be somebody like a burden in the second or third round because right now we have a need at both offensive tackle and kind of at corner, but I think it's going to end up – honestly, I, I'd like it to be your boy Jordan Morgan to yeah. be at tackle for us. I, I really like him. That's who I want us to pick. But I also really feel like if DaCosta's sitting there and it's A.D. Mitchell or Xavier Worthy sitting there at 30 and the tackles that we like are gone but some of the second-round ones aren't, second, third-round ones aren't, I can definitely see them just drafting A.D. Mitchell or Xavier Worthy and then trading up in the second round to draft a tackle. I can I can definitely see that. I would not hate Kool-Aid across from from Humphrey though. Kool Aid man and, and Marlon another motherfucker I played against. Marlon. Another guy you have stories about too that uh, I know your ass ain't gonna share on the show. Hell no, I ain't telling him. <laughs> <laughs> Marlon, Marlo's ass Marlo's getting to the point to where he I, I think the injuries are starting to pile up and he's been playing for us since what, twenty 16. So yeah. he, he, I think he's getting to that point to where he's getting on the back nine of his career. So we do need to look at that next guy that's going to be our lock at corner. Brandon Stevens is a really good second corner, but I don't think he'll ever be that guy that we can rely on as our shutdown shadow everybody corner. I don't, I don't think he'll, like he has the range too, but I mean, the man did play running back for two years. So yeah. it's still a learning curve there. Yeah. Um, and speaking of defender DB, man, if I think Kyle Hamilton goes even crazier next season than he did this season, I think Kyle Hamilton's going to be really good. I was really happy that draft. Both of the players we wanted, I got for the second straight year. We got yeah. both of the players I wanted because the year we, well, one year we got Bateman and Oway, and starting to look like I was wrong on that one. But <laughs> and this that last year, I, the year before, I wanted Linderbaum and um, Kyle Hamilton. Yeah. Everybody was worried about. Linderbaum size and Kyle Hamilton speed and both again, all pro. Right. And again, <laughs> that's why I don't understand why we pay certain people so much to give us their opinion on football because it doesn't really seem to hold much weight in the end of the day. Like at the end of the day, people can say, Oh, I'm worried about this foot with Kool-Aid, I'm worried about this and I know what I saw on film. Yeah. Film ain't gonna lie to you, you know what I mean? Like I, I know exactly what I saw. And that's what I think more people need to evaluate. Like, I mean, people try to tell me I was crazy when I brought it up. I remember and Aaron Donald, when he was first coming out of pit, everybody was like, yeah, he's a freak, but, like, he's only 6'1". He's only six feet tall. He's not that big. Right. And, I was, and I said, so? Did you just watch? Didn't, didn't you just see that motherfucker tackle the quarterback and the running back on a read option? <laughs> coming from the coming from the one technique. I mean, he's, got, he, I mean, he's in between the center and the guard shoulder. I mean, he got an automatic double team. He beat yeah. both ASs and tackled both players. Yeah. I remember that one play he had at Pitt where he 
literally bull rush both the guard and the center into the running back. <laughs> you know how like, dumb what, strong like, you have to be. <laughs> right, like what? Like same thing with Chris Jones. I don't, like when he was coming out of Mississippi State. I don't know. He was kind of slow. Did Did you watch the same film I did? Yeah. Like all that extra shit you can make up to say why a player won't be good is not going to negate what I've seen him do on film. Yeah. That's why. Like. That's also why I get why Alex doesn't care for Keon Coleman because after going back and watching Keon Coleman's film, yeah, some of the catches are impressive, but like he catches with his body. He's a and body if you can't get separation day. versus a if you can't get separation versus a slow corner, kind of tells me a lot. You ain't gonna be able to do shit in the league <laughs> if at, you can't look get at, separation. Yeah, look at QJ out in, in in LA with the Chargers. That's who Keon Coleman is. I was so I was so happy that we didn't fall for the Brashad because that's Brashad Perryman in a different yeah. body. That's yeah. all that is. Somebody that's fast that don't know what the fuck to do with it. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. It. Somebody yep. that's fast and athletic and has zero idea what to do with it. It's like having a Ferrari and no keys. So the last thing I'll ask you, and then we'll we'll get out of here because I know you got to get off to work. But mm-hmm. top five guys you'd like to see the Ravens draft. I want you to publicly say it. <laughs> oh God, yes. Okay, I'm. <laughs> All right, three of them we ain't going to get, but Dallas Turner, Kool-Aid, A.D. Mitchell, Tavondre Sweat, because I just – I damn good defensive tackles, man. I just – and having him next to Matt Week would be something insane to watch, especially with how thin we are at edge. won't matter how thin we are if we got two big motherfuckers collapsing the pocket from the interior. Yeah. And let's see, that's four. Jordan Morgan, just because I got to have some sense. Yeah, you got to have, we got to have a tackle somewhere, bro. Got to have a tackle somewhere because right now it's looking like it's going to be me and that and me and Moss playing tackle for the race. <laughs> so. I get you. I get you. Well, hey, we'd be good with Jordan Morgan, bro. I watched him, you know, his whole After career. Watching this film, all he's a dancing bear, bro. Exactly. My favorite kind of tackle. All, all the little intangibles that they say, oh, his arms aren't that long. I don't care. I, yeah. I don't care. He, he, he can play. That's all yeah. that matters. Yes, sir. Well, hey, thank you so much for joining the show, brother. It was cool to hear a little bit about that Alabama history. Mm-hmm. you got a wealth of knowledge, bro. I know A-Day was yesterday. You brought a little bit of that flavor as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's see how Alabama can do this year, if they can upset Georgia one more time and, and get back to the promised land. Won't be an upset to get their ass beat again. Check the record on that sketch. Check the record between them two teams. Man. <laughs> Kirby done beat him once. <laughs> well hey i feel like all we hear about is georgia nowadays so it'd be kind of cool to see alabama go in there and remind them real mm-hmm. quick i mean of course dude. when you deflate for the month you got to keep talking remember clemson <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you this show ain't a fan of clemson so don't worry about that <laughs> oh man all hey, right brother thanks for having well, me brother i appreciate you of course buddy i'll talk to you later then